more people kind of trickling in, I'm sure. Um, so my name is Rachel Barasa and welcome to the Grassworks Summer Ask a Grazer uh, discussion slash meeting. Uh, we were hoping to be out at Andy Jaworski's organic farm uh, for a picnic this year, but since we weren't able to do that, we invited Steve Kenyon to come and talk to us. Um, so for the, this is part of the Grassworks Ask a Grazer series. So in addition to this webinar, we've got our Google group and then we've got a Facebook group too. So I can always post those resources. So this is kind of piggybacking on those. Um, um, my name is Rachel Barasa. I do a direct market grass-fed beef from my family's farm in central Wisconsin. And then I also work for Golden Sands as a grazing plan writer and outreach coordinator. Um, I'm trying to think of, and then my other role is on the Grassworks board. And so I wanted to acknowledge any of the other Grassworks board members that are on the call today. I see Aaron Pape, if you want to just say hi. Hey folks. Um, I saw Kevin Mahalko, our president on. If Kevin, you want to say hi and give an introduction. Hi, Rachel. I just wanted to welcome Steve to, to our generally Wisconsin meeting here. So we thank you for uh, help, helping out tonight with Grassworks. It's in lieu of our picnic, and we're looking forward to hearing from you. Excellent. Glad to be here. All right. And then the other kind of facilitators we have on tonight, we've got Heather Flashinsky, which is she's on our Grassworks staff. She does a lot with coordinating our annual conference, um, which will be held a little differently this year. Um, that I think, I don't know if we have any updates on that, otherwise it'll just be um, to be determined. And then we're going to have Derek Rasper tonight. Um, I'll be helping moderate. Derek Rasper is a soil conservationist with NRCS out of the Wapaka County branch. Um, and he also works with the Upper Fox Wolf Demo Farms um, and is a really good advocate for grazing in our area. So I'll turn it over to you, Derek, to introduce Steve and we'll get going. Uh, well, I don't have much of an introduction for Steve. I think he's gonna kind of take care of it himself. So uh, without taking up too much of his time, I guess we'll just get rolling with what he's got. Oh, and I guess I should add as far as kind of the housekeeping and stuff, if you can rename yourself um, so that we can assign you to, so we're going to do the regular discussion up until uh, probably about nine o'clock. If you have questions, feel free to uh, raise your, I don't know if they've got a raise your hand feature, but you can enter them in the chat or, um, you know, maybe unmute yourself later on and ask your questions. Um, we're also streaming on Facebook Live, I think. So there may be some questions coming in from there. Um, but after Steve's presentation, we're gonna have a mostly open discussion Q&A that's open for anyone to kind of chime in as well. All right, that's, I think it. Perfect. Yeah, we'll let Steve do his thing and then we have some of the questions you guys submitted early on and we'll walk through those and then we'll open it up for more. So go ahead, okay, Steve, take it away. Good. Sounds good. I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to just mention to everybody that uh, if we start to have some internet problems, we should probably shut down the videos of the participants. Um, we don't necessarily need to see them, but uh, if it starts to cause some issues, I don't know how, there's a few of them on there, I think, but um, so far everything's working good. So I think we can go ahead. Okay, can everybody see my screen? Sure can. Okay, just sorry, I'm moving some stuff around so I can see it properly. Okay, um, we are going to basically just do a very basic introductory to uh, regenerative grazing today. Um, I apologize, I know through a webinar we don't quite get the interaction that we would in person, but uh, um, I have to take out all my jokes because I don't know if you guys are laughing or not. So um, see, there's a free joke without even putting a joke in. But we're going to talk about regenerative grazing and uh, the basics of it. And then we can get into some questions after. So a little bit about our ranch. Um, we are from a little town called Busby, Alberta. Um, we uh, do run a custom grazing operation. It is kind of like a 
private community pasture. We uh, rent land from private landowners and we join them together and try and make bigger pastures. And then we graze other people's animals. So kind of a different uh, agricultural setup. We graze other people's cattle on other people's land. So we don't actually own any of the land that we, that we graze on. Um, our uh, farm is more about building, bu building the soil and, and, and protecting the environment than it is about raising animals. Um, I don't even need to own the animals to be able to do what I'm doing. So our mission statement at Greener Pastures Ranching is economic and environmental sustainability for generations. So that pretty well says what we're all about. Uh, we got to be able to make a profit in the long run and we've got to be, you know, keep, take care of our resources so that we can be making a profit 50 years from now or, you know, when the next generation or multiple generations is taking over this, these lands. And I'm not even talking about my kids, right? It's the, just the next generation. I think we need to make sure we're uh, taking care of things for them. So that's our basic uh, philosophy. So what do we do? We do year round custom grazing. So we do also custom feed in the winter but we'll use a grazing mentality. We'll be swath grazing or we'll be bale grazing. Um, so we do keep some animals for the winter as well. Uh, just as a, an idea of what, what, what we're doing, in the summertime, we'll have between you know, 1,200 to 1,400 head that we're grazing. And in the wintertime, we might graze you know, 100 head to 300 head maybe, uh, depending on the situation and depending on what customers we have at the time. So. Um, we also have a small profit center of pasture pigs. Uh, we do work with some customers and or neighbors and sell some grass fed beef sometimes as well. So, um, but they're not, not very big. Those are pretty small profit centers. Our main operation is the custom grazing. We also somehow got into con consulting. Uh, you, probably about 15 years ago or more, people were interested in what I was doing and asking lots of questions and all of a sudden we got doing some seminars and some conferences and then it turned into schools and, and uh, workshops. So that's another side of our business that uh, has kind of grown. Um, so now in the wintertime we do sessions and seminars, but uh, in the summertime we're just basically doing our grazing. So um, we started to teach, but what do we teach? Okay, what, what you're going to learn from me uh, doesn't come in a box, a bag, or a bottle. Our industry is addicted to quick fixes. And that's not what we're about. So we just teach about management. Um, we believe in dealing with a problem instead of addressing symptoms. Okay, our industry continually has symptoms pop up and you can, you know, buy something in a box, a bag or a bottle and you can address a symptom. But the, pro the issue there is that the problem is still there. Uh, real quick example, uh, you've got some weeds in your pasture. That's a symptom. The problem is it's being overgrazed. That's why the weeds are there. So if we can, you know, go in there with a symptom solver, you know, you're going to spray it out or, or try and cultivate it up. All you're doing is addressing the symptom. You're not addressing the problem. So if you solve the problem of overgrazing, then the weeds will go away. Okay? So I'm always looking at addressing problems, not symptoms. Um, a big part of our operation. Now, I wish we could do that in agriculture itself. Because one of the biggest problems we have in agriculture that we need to deal with is uh, right here. I don't know if you guys have ever seen this graph before, but it is um, a research project, project done by Darren Qualman out of Saskatchewan. They did the Canadian net farm income from 1926 to 2016. So it's a couple of years ago. Um, the top of the blue line is the total net farm income. And the top of the green line is the percentage that the farmer gets to take home. I don't know if any of you guys can tell me, but what's the problem with this graph? <laughs> Pretty obvious, right? Who's, who's making all the profit? Not the farmer. Now this is a Canadian graph, but in the US, I'm sure it's very similar. The only difference I would say would be that little red blip in uh, 202, 203, 206. Um, that was when the drought hit us and BSE hit us in 203. So you can see how that dropped down quite substantially there. Um, you guys actually, I think, got a little bit of a, a boost from that for part of it. But other than that, generally, that graph would be the same in just about any country, I think. So this is a big issue. In about 1985, 
right, or a little bit earlier than that, we started really taking a hit, even back in the 70s. So we need to change this graph. You'll notice in 207 that that green part of the graph starts to go up. That, that I believe is because of the uh, ethanol industry that the, when the U.S. opened it up. Okay, that boosted up a lot of the grain farmers because all that subsidy went into the ethanol business. But if you think about it, who really made the profit out of that? You can see the blue line went up a lot, a lot higher than the green did. So we need to solve this. Now, I think we have a solution though. Um, what I teach about is regenerative agriculture. I think it's a solution to this problem. Um, there's a really good quote um, I heard a while back. The light bulb did not get in, uh, invented by incrementally increasing the brightness of the candle. Okay, so we didn't get a candle and make it a little bit brighter and a little bit brighter and a little bit brighter, and then boom, there was a light bulb. That didn't happen, right? It was a totally different idea, a revolutionary idea, totally different than what the normal was. So that's what we need to do in agriculture right now. We, ne we need to get away from what's modern agriculture, what's considered normal, and look at something totally new. Um, I believe that regenerative agriculture is that light bulb, uh, and the answer's under our feet. We need to... Uh, switch over to a regenerative management. Okay, so I have a quick question for you. Do plants grow from the soil? That's what modern agriculture assumes, okay? They put in a seed, it grows, it uses up nutrients out of the soil uh, to, to produce this plant. We harvest that off and take those nutrients away. So basically your plants are using up the soil to grow. Okay, that's modern agriculture. That's their thinking. Um, the problem is, I think that's wrong. Okay, so the elemental makeup of any plant, so any grass, any crop, any tree, any shrub, uh, elemental makeup is approximately 45% carbon, 45% oxygen, 6% hydrogen, and 1.5% nitrogen. Okay, so 97.5% of the plant are those four elements. And that's on a dry matter basis. That doesn't include all the water that's technically in them. So 97.5%. Every single nutrient in that list, we get from the air, not the soil. So plants don't really grow from the soil. They're growing from the air. 97.5. Only 2.5% they need to get from the soil. So that's a, a big difference. Um, here's a picture of a a hole at Greener Pastures Ranching. You can see that here. I'll use my mouse if you can see the mouse. There's little triangles coming down here. There's a triangle there. There's a bit of a triangle there and a triangle there. So what we're doing is we're actually growing soil. So the plants take use photosynthesis. They pull carbon out of the air and transform it into glucose in the plant. That's what makes up the, the plant. It also makes up the roots, right? The entire plant. It translocates into the root system. As it's growing and photosynthesizing, it's also taking this sugar and pushing it out the root tips and feeding the soil. Okay, so we're, it's called exudation or exudate. So it's pushing exudate out into the soil. Now this uh, glucose basically is gluing the soil together. Um, the silt, sand, and clay, it's gluing them together and making good aggregation. Um, it's adding carbon to the, to the ground. And you can see with these triangles is that's where a root was. And we're basically this, we're in a, a gray wooded soil. So we're very, very sticky, muddy clay when you, if you ever rip up the ground. Um, we're actually converting this clay into soil because that root went down and then pushed out sugars. Um, we're not building necessarily topsoil on top of the ground. We're actually going down into the clay and converting it into soil. So we're using plants to grow the soil. Right, big different from what, how modern agriculture looks at it. Okay. Here's another example. We took, uh, we had a study with the University of Alberta, a carbon sequestration study. So this was a couple of core samples taken from the two pieces of land that they were studying. One was on the uh, regeneratively grazed piece of land and one was on a continuously grazed piece of land. So previously, these, this land was uh, managed very similarly over the last 50 years. Um, 12 years earlier, I started regeneratively grazing the one on the left. Okay, so that's the top three inches. That's how much I've changed it in 12 years. 
So we're literally growing soil by using those plants. So that's a really good example of that. Agriculture is all concerned about fertilizing. Okay, I'm not a big proponent of fertilizer because I, I believe that we're, we're doing things wrong. When 97.5% of that nutrients comes from the air, we shouldn't have to add fertilizer at all. Okay, we we're, we're, need to be building the soil, not mining it. Modern agriculture is constantly mining the soil. So we need to think about it differently. We don't have a fertility issue in agriculture. We have a biological issue. Okay, we need to uh, build soil organisms, get a, a live, vibrant soil. 85 to 90% of plant nutrition is microbiotically mediated. We need bugs in the soil, and we'll get into that shortly. But it's not, it's not about adding fertility to your soil. It's about building biology. That's what we need to do. Here's a real quick visual example. So we don't have a lot of equipment at Greener Pastures Ranching. Uh, we run 3,500 acres, and I don't even own a tractor. Um, this is my cedar. I've got a uh, little quad mounted cedar that I can mount on the tailgate or on a quad or wherever I need to. It's just 12, operated by a 12 volt battery and I can broadcast seed. So this was our setup. It's in the back of the pickup. You can carry all your seed with you. Uh, the bags of cedar there. So what we did uh, last summer or last spring, uh, we took over a grain field. It was canola stubble. You can see the stubble there. Um, we broadcast and trampled. That's what B and T stands for, broadcast and trample. So we broadcast a bunch of seeds out there. It was a polyculture. Um, I believe it was tw 21 different species. So we're trying to get a polyculture of uh, different types of plants out there. Uh, broadcast it out there, and then we turned the cows out to, to harrow it in. So we got them to trample it. Uh, they grazed down. Most of that is volunteer canola that they're grazing. And we knocked it down in probably about three days. They were out there and knocked it right down. Okay, so that was in June of 2019. By September of 2019, this is what it looked like. Okay, we had a vibrant polyculture that just took off. We had lots of moisture that year and uh, we had a beautiful, beautiful crop come up. We didn't add any fertilizer. Where did all that nutrients come from? Okay, um, how about uh, this year? Okay, now we set that cover crop um, as a, we had some annuals in there as well but the idea was to get it into a perennial polyculture for grazing, right? A, a forage for grazing. So now we're moving into more perennials on year two. There's sweet clover in there. There's loads of red clover, uh, some alfalfa, lots of grasses, um, but the annuals are all fading out and then the perennials are taken over. So, but where did the fertility come from? Okay. With that polyculture roots uh, created a polyculture of soil organisms. And now we're getting 97.5% of that from the air. And then 2.5% we need to get from the soil. So that's uh, not, not hard to do. So it's not about adding fertilizer. We need to build the biology. Okay. So just to recap, modern agriculture grows plants from the soil. Regenerative agriculture grows soil from the plants. That's a huge difference in thinking. And I think we need to change our mind, get that light bulb on and, uh, Think about things differently. Are you growing soil or are you growing plants? Okay, we will kick into the basics of how I do that now. How do I manage all this in, in uh, regeneratively? Uh, it's easy to say that word, but uh, how do we actually do that? So I've got five grazing concepts we're gonna go through, and then I've also got five grazing principles that we're gonna touch on, just to kind of give you the basics of what we're, we're talking about. So the grazing concepts, we've got graze period and rest period. They kind of work together. Now, we have to understand the basics of, of how gr grass grows. We have stage one, plant comes up as a perennial that has to come from the root reserves. So there's an energy store in the plant. Uh, stage two early, um, we've got that plants started to grow from the root reserves. Now we've got some photosynthesis happening and we start to build the plant by using the sunlight. But at this point, the root reserves are low. So the, let's call it a fuel tank. Okay, the fuel tank was full in stage one. To grow, we used that fuel tank up and now it's almost empty. Okay, then we get later into stage two, we start getting more productive, more vegetative growth. Um, we're getting a lot more sunshine and photosynthesis created. Now it can not only grow more leaves, but also start replenishing that fuel tank. Okay, we're starting to fill the tank. Uh, stage three, then it's maturing 
uh, and going to seed, that's what it's, the plant's trying to do. Okay, we'll extend that a little bit. So let's say that plant's growing up, photosynthesis is doing well, the root reserves are full, and we come along and graze that plant down. Uh, photosynthesis gets reduced because a bunch of that green matter gets taken off. The plant also sloughs off some roots. It says, you know what, we don't need the top. There's a, there's a mirror that happens at the soil surface. Whatever happens above the ground also happens below ground. So when you cut off the top, it also says we don't need all these root systems and some die off. That's a good thing. We're actually building soil by having those roots decompose now. So we let that plant regrow now after being cut. Um, it has, depending how deeply it was cut or not, um, we have to let that recover. Um, the root reserves are empty or the fuel tank is empty. In that early stage two, it is uh, an issue by allowing them to regraze it at that point. Okay, that is tr truly the definition of overgrazing when uh, we're grazing plants in early stage two growth. Okay, right, right there, that, that can hurt the plants. Uh, if we let it get into later stage two, plants are up, not mature yet, but the root reserves have been replenished. The plant is nice and healthy and strong. At that point, it can be regrazed. Okay, so how does graze period and rest period work there? We have to have a short enough graze period to not allow animals to take a second bite. So if you turn the animals out in st stage two, they take the first bite, they nip that plant down, the roots die off, and then they're out there long enough that those plants start to regrow. Okay, if you're allowed them to take that second bite right there, that's overgrazing. Okay, we wanna stop that. Uh, rest period's very similar. It's the same thing we're trying to prevent. If we were to put those animals out there real quick, graze it, and then take them off, the plants start to regrow, but we put the animals back out there too soon, so our rest period's too short, and we put them out there when it's still in that early stage two, we're gonna cause overgrazing. We're gonna take that second bite before that plant is, is healthy enough to, um, to replenish those root reserves, okay? So that's simple. Overgrazing is caused when you're grazing in that, when the fuel tank's empty. So we've gotta understand what's going on underneath the soil as well as above. Okay, so graze period and rest period have to work together. You can think of it as a, when you make hay, okay, you let it grow, right? It's got a nice rest period, it grows up. You cut it down in one day and harvest it off, hopefully, and then you let it grow again. So that's all we're doing with our pastures, but we have a whole bunch of little pastures. Um, I can't park my grazing equipment in the shed for a month and let it grow. So we have to have a whole bunch of little hay fields that we're allowing a, a good graze period and a good rest period. All right. Okay, so grace period and rest period. Uh, next is animal impact. That is the uh, physical impact of the hooves on the soil. Okay, it can affect the water cycle. So if you've got a capped soil, it can uh, break, break open that capped soil, uh, allow water to infiltrate through. Uh, it can recycle nutrients. The mineral cycle can, you know, when you get that soil contact with the dead material, it'll, it'll decompose and recycle quicker. Uh, seedling development. Okay, you can, that hoof action can cause seed to soil contact and have new seedlings growing. Um, that's a big part of animal impact. Um, a lot of people can do that with a set of harrows. They go out with a set of harrows and try and do all those things. It can work, but the one thing that the set of harrows is missing on animal impact is the biology. Okay, biology is so important out here and the interaction between the herbivore and the soil uh, is crucial. Okay, the best biology you can have um, you know, everybody's talking about putting compost on their land or putting a, a compost tea out on their land. Uh, the best compost you can have is, is manure, okay, right out of the back end of the cow. And the best uh, tea you can put on your land is the urine right out of the cow. Um, you can't get any better than that. And it's uh, a lot cheaper to let her do all that for you. So we get biology from the manure and the urine. We also get bi biology from the saliva, right, as they're grazing, they're kind of uh, putting biology out on the ground, even from their phlegm, you know, that big gob of snot that's dripping. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah, that's biology or food for biology. There's even biology that's falling off their hair coats that's interacting and, and having symbiotic relationships with the biology in the soil. Okay, either it's food or uh, it, it uh, can be eaten by, by other biology. So there's symbiotic relationships that we don't know anything about, but it's been there for centuries. So we need to keep those animals on the land. Okay, you don't get that with a tractor and a set of harrows. You don't get the biology. So animal impact's really important out there on our land. 
Stock density. Stock density is uh, the higher it is, the better. Okay. So I'm not talking about stocking rate. Stocking rate for me would be the number of animals I have on a pasture for a whole season. Okay. So I have a hundred cows out there for the summer. That's stocking rate. What I'm talking about is stock density. So it would be how tightly those animals are bunched together when they're grazing. Okay. Are they allowed to spread out over a whole big piece of land or with high stock density, they're, they're bunched into a smaller piece. So those 100 cows on 10 acres for two days, okay, that's a higher stock density. Um, this picture is of what I call mob grazing. Um, we're going to move this fence, uh, you know, probably five or six or seven times a day. Um, so they're very, very high stock density. Okay, so what's the benefit to high stock density? Well, two things. One is better plant utilization, and the other one is better manure distribution. So plant utilization, think of that hay buying going across your field again. It cuts every plant. So no plant gets an advantage. No plant gets to go to seed over the others. Uh, everything gets knocked, knocked down. So in a continuous grazing situation, the cattle go out and pick and choose their favorite plants and allow the undesirables to go to seed and reproduce. So perfect uh, conditions for the undesirables, right? They get to, to uh, reproduce and be prolific and, uh, and grow until they ripe old age and die. Um, we're basically taking out their competition and we wonder why we get a bunch of weeds in the, uh, in your pastures. Okay. So the higher the stock density, um, you put those cows in a lot tighter group, they either eat or step on or poop on every single plant out there, right? We're, we're, our goal is to knock down everything, give it a, a, an even playing field to regrow. The other one is manure distribution the higher your stock density, the better they spread around the manure and the urine. Um, if you're mob grazing, you, you make sure you don't wear your town shoes when you go out there because it's hard to avoid it. There's manure everywhere. Whereas if you're continuous grazing, all the manure ends up where? By the water, under the tree, um, you know, where they hang out. It, it takes a long time to spread that around. Um, in a high stock density situation, we get a nice even spread throughout the whole pasture. We want to, you know, the nutrients that is coming out of the land, we want to put, put it right back in. So stock density is really important to get it as high as you can. Now there is an economic uh, part to that as well, but I'm not going to get into that. Uh, I don't believe in mob grazing everything because the economics of it doesn't always work. It, it's a lot of labor and equipment costs. There's a balance on every pasture of how intense you should be. And that might be for another talk. Soil armor is the last grazing concept. Um, this is one that I was missing for many, many years in my operation. I didn't think it was quite as important. So, um, which that was a huge mistake. One of the most important parts of my operation now is soil armor, building soil armor. So um, what is soil armor? Basically leaving residue on your land, okay? On this uh, picture here, the right-hand side, we grazed it pretty hard. Uh, it's not overgrazed because they were only out there three days, but they took everything right? There's not much left on there. On the left-hand side of the, the fence, then they were probably out there for about two days and we leave quite a bit of residue out there. So there's three things I need to feed. One, I need to feed the livestock. Two, I need to so feed the soil organisms. And three, I need to cover the soil. I need to leave the soil armor so that we um, can help improve the water cycle. But we're going to get into water cycle too. But that soil armor is very, very important. Um, it's like I said, it's if I could go back 20 years and tell myself one thing to do better, that's to leave more residue. Okay, you need to leave as much as you can cash flow. Uh, repairs the water cycle, regulates temperature, uh, shelter for your, your underground army of workers. So all my biology in the soil, I call them my employees. They work for me. So it's, it's their, their, uh, their home. We need to give them a roof over their head. So I always say leave as much residue as you can cash flow. Uh, I know when I started out, that was the issue. You know, you custom grazing, that's your revenue. If you leave your animals out there an extra day on every paddock, well, at the end of the season, you know, that's an extra thousand bucks in my pocket. Uh, but in the long run, that's hurting me because we get a drought the next year and then I lose $30,000. So what I've found is the leave as much as you can, especially on a good year. This year, we're having lots of moisture in our environment. This is a perfect year to leave residue. Leave as much as you can because then in a drought year, it won't hurt you so bad. Okay, so definitely leave as much residue as you can. Okay, so that's the basic grazing concepts. Um, 
as you can see from the slide here, it's really easy to remember because it spells grass, G-R-A-S-S. Um, it was an eight-year-old in one of my presentations that pointed that out to me one time, so I, I didn't invent it. We'll also quickly look at the grazing principles. Okay, so the uh, grazing concepts are kind of the how. Um, I'm going to say this is the why. So we're going to use those concepts. We're going to manage for a good, you know, graze period and rest period and stock density, animal impact, and soil armor. This is the why. Okay, we're going to build a, a healthy water cycle. Okay, that's number one. Healthy water cycle is very important. Uh, one of my greatest mentors ever is Alan Savory. I love this quote. The soil is the greatest reservoir of, of fresh water in the world, by far, if properly treated. Greater than all the dams, rivers, and lakes. Uh, I honestly believe all of the issues with climate change, everything that's out there, fires, floods, droughts, severe weather, we could mitigate if we could just fix the water cycle on a global scale. Right? And agriculture is a huge, huge part of that. Uh, we've been damaging the water cycle for centuries. Uh, we need to fix that and we could pretty well eliminate the issue of, of climate change. Okay, we just need to hold on to that water. So um, water cycle, really important. We need to solve uh, these three issues. Okay? We need to reduce runoff. When rain comes down, let's look at it on a microscopic level. When rain, the first raindrop comes down and it hits bare exposed soil. Okay? Um, on a microscopic level, that's like a hand grenade going off. That little raindrop comes down and explodes and damages the soil structure. Remember I talked about how the exudate glues particles together? Well, this raindrop comes down and explodes and bursts them all apart. So then we're back to silt, sand, and clay and the organic matter that's left that can wash away. Okay, so we're damaging soil structure. You've seen capped soil. Um, it's a smooth surface and when it dries, it cracks. Okay, that's the problem. We're damaging that structure. Um, the, the big issue comes the second raindrop. Okay, the first raindrop caused the capped soil. The second raindrop comes down, can't penetrate through it. Now it only, the only way it can go is to run off. Okay, and the more slope you have, the faster the runoff. So we have an, an enormous amount of runoff and erosion in agriculture due to a poor water cycle. Okay, we're damaging the soil structure. We're not absorbing it. Um, so, you know, let's say you're in a 12 inch rainfall area. Boy, with runoff, how much do you actually get? What's your effective rainfall versus your actual rainfall. So we need to stop that. How do we do that? Leave residue. We just talked about that. Uh, if we can leave the residue, that live or dead plant material on the surface, we call it soil armor. Um, it protects the soil. The, the plants are stronger than the raindrop. The raindrop is stronger than the soil. So if that raindrop comes down now and hits plant material, live or dead, now the raindrop will burst into tiny little droplets. Okay, now the raindrop gets damaged, not the soil. Then it can soak down into the soil gently and not do any damage, not have near as much evaporation. Okay. Um, very powerful demonstration, if you ever get a chance to see it, is a rainfall simulator. Boy, that's powerful. Um, I'm sure some of you have seen them. I love that thing. I want to buy one just for my farm. Um, number two is evaporation. We also have to, to reduce the amount of evaporation that comes out of our soil. So once it's in there, okay, rainfall comes down by gravity, but once you've got moisture in your soil, it no longer works by gravity. Now it works by diffusion. Now diffusion is a movement from an area of greater concentration to an area of lesser concentration. So wet to dry, real simple. Um, if you've got bare exposed soil and the wind's blowing across it and the, the sun's beating down on it and heating it up, then the top moisture evaporates, right? Just like it would if it was sitting on the, on the concrete. Now the issue comes is the bottom moisture from down below will now diffuse, move up to the surface because it's dry. And now that'll evaporate off and then more will move up and then that'll evaporate. So this is wrong. We're supposed to be doing infiltration. We're supposed to be going down with our moisture, not coming up. So we, we need to stop that. How do we do that? Cover the soil. If we can get a a roof over top of that, it's going to hold that moisture in, not let it evaporate near as quickly. Okay. What we've caused in agriculture is a reverse water cycle. Okay. So we have moisture that's evaporating out of the soil, going up into the cl forming clouds, precipitating down, causing capped soil, and then running off and filling our streams and creeks and rivers from surface runoff. 
And when we do that, it's also taking all of our good organic matter, all of our carbon that we've been building there is getting washed away. So that's an unhealthy water cycle. What we need to do is create a healthy water cycle. In, in a healthy water cycle, we have moisture evaporating from the dugouts and creeks and rivers and lakes, forming clouds, precipitating down, landing on the uh, soil armor and soaking into the ground, infiltrating through and filling our creeks and rivers from underground. Okay, uh, we want it to go through the soil first before it fills the creeks and rivers and dugouts. Okay, so that's a healthy water cycle. Um, we have very little of that in agriculture. Uh, we have a lot of unhealthy water cycle in agriculture. So that's what regenerative grazing is trying to do is, is to build that water cycle. One of my most important aspects of regenerative agriculture is fixing the water cycle. Um, very rewarding when you actually see that work too. Uh, infiltration, it's another way you can lose moisture. I just said that it's a good thing going down, but in some situations, uh, let's say you have a really sandy soil, uh, you can lose water to the ground way too fast, right? It just rains down and soaks through and is gone right away. So our job is to build soil to hold on to that. So we talked about that exudation and the roots dying off and the, the thatch layer on top. Um, we need to build soil. It's our goal is to build soil to hold on to that water. Looks like she's I don't care what your base is, whether it's sandy it's or sandy. clay or silt, I want to make sure we've got a lot of organic matter there to, to hold on to that moisture and slow infiltration. I want it to infiltrate through, but I don't want it to go fast. Okay, so that's my uh, uh, issue there. I'm trying to fix the water cycle. Uh, the fourth one is actually plant utilization, and that's a good thing. That is our effective rainfall. How much moisture do your plants actually get to use versus how much showed up in your rain gauge? Okay, so biggest goal I have is to get as much effective rainfall as I can. We're in a 15 inch rain, uh, rainfall zone. Um, I want 14 inches of it every season, right? Most producers around me probably get out of that 15, they probably use maybe four or five, just, just my guess. But I want 14 out of that 15. Um, Water is the most important nutrient we have. Okay, riparian area management as well. Um, holding on to it. Um, building riparian areas, we're gonna talk about some biology coming up here and this is the basics, the starting of it. Uh, it just frustrates me when, when producers drain land and drain out these riparian areas. Uh, it's tremendous breeding grounds for a lot of uh, insects and, and uh, animals that are beneficial to our operation. And second grazing principle. Um, I'm in the business of harvesting sunlight. Okay, I'm not in the cattle business. I'm not in the grazing business. I'm in the business of harvesting sunlight. Um, that's where we get our energy for life on the planet. Okay, so I want to catch as much sunlight as I possibly can. Um, that's where we get photosynthesis. Uh, nothing else on the planet can do it other than plants, right? We need to be able to collect a, a lot of sunlight to, to make my business profitable. And in my area, um, we get about four and a half months of growing season. So that's a pretty short growing season for most places. I want to get as much of that as possible. I don't really have control on that. Our winter comes and our winter comes. So um, I want as much as possible. So I need to increase how much sunlight I capture. I want to increase the time. I'm going to talk about that right away. And the density in the leaf area. I, want, I don't want sunlight coming down hitting bare soil because it reflects it. I want it hitting green, growing, vibrant grasses or legumes or shrubs or plants or trees. Okay? And I want a bigger leaf area. I want more efficient plants. I want uh, to catch every sunbeam that I possibly can. Okay, so we'll talk a little bit about time here. Um, we only have a four and a half month growing season. I want to make sure that I can get as much of that as possible. Okay, as soon as the conditions are ready in the spring, I want my plants jumping out of the ground. Okay, I absolutely want them jumping out of the ground. I want the moisture there. I want the nutrients there. I want the root systems to be strong. Remember that fuel tank? I want that fuel tank full. So I couldn't, I don't want to overgraze the year before and have those plants go into the dorm, dormant season with an empty fuel tank. I wanna make sure everything's good and strong. So just a real quick example, here's a picture at Greener Pastures Ranching. This picture was taken on May 15th, my side of the fence and the neighbor's side of the fence, okay? Obviously I'm getting more growth in the spring than he is, right? My plants are ready to jump out of the ground. You can see the residue there uh, left before. So I'm probably two weeks ahead of him at least in, in growing season. So I've still got my four and a half months uh, he just lost two weeks off his. Okay, you can zoom in a little bit, but 
Um, late season growth, same thing. Um, September, middle of September in, our, in my environment, we get the killing frost and that's pretty well the end of our growing season. Um, right up until that day, I want my plants capturing sunlight, right? I want them capturing sunlight. I want them building root reserves and growing more material right up until that day. Um, here's that same fence line photo in the fall. Um, my side still has good, very efficient stage two grasses. We talked about stage one, stage two, and stage three grasses. Stage one and stage three, not very efficient. Stage two is the ideal uh, uh, stage for, for capturing sunlight. Across the fence, you can see a bunch of Canada thistle. Uh, it's mature. It's uh, gone to seed, basically. It's not collecting sunlight very much. And there's a bunch of grasses out there that are all mature as well, uh, not collecting sunlight. In between, there's a whole bunch of grasses that are grazed off to nothing, probably went dormant uh, much earlier than this, and uh, not collecting very much sunlight. So we want to collect as much sunlight as we can. We also want to increase that, you know, capturing sunlight throughout the whole season. Again, that stage one and stage three, not very productive. So I'm trying to keep all of my pasture as much as I can in stage two growth. If I let it, if I graze it right down to nothing, we're not very efficient in that stage one. Or if I let it get mature, we're not very efficient. So I'm just gonna grow more grass than the neighbor is. Uh, drought resilience too. If we hit a drought, which we get lots of droughts, in the last 11 years, we've had seven years of drought. Um, the last two years have been really, really wet, but uh, the extremes are, are hard to take sometimes. But when we do get a drought, um, if I've managed my plants correctly in the good years, right? If I've got lots of residue, that soil armor is there and I've got the water cycle working, boy, the drought doesn't hit me very hard. Okay, my neighbors can be completely shut down and, and nothing growing and I still have beautiful grass that's still in stage two growing effectively because I have a good water cycle. Uh, the moisture is not evaporating out of my soils and I can hold, hold on. I can go two months without any rain and my plants don't hesitate because I've built up a good uh, soil structure and, and, and a good soil armor. Um, after about two weeks, my neighbor's pasture will shut down. Okay. And I just want the nutrients available there all the time. So we're recycling that nutrients all the time, um, which moves us to our next principle, nutrient recycling. Um, matter cannot be created or destroyed. This is a law. Okay. It's not an idea. It's not a, you know, a thought. It's a law. Um, there's a set amount of carbon on this planet. It just goes through a cycle. There's a set amount of nitrogen on this planet. Um, it just has to go through a cycle. So if there's a water shortage, right? Uh, Southern Alberta, California, Australia, whoever, if they're having a water shortage, it is not a shortage. It's a mismanaged cycle, okay? There's a set amount of hydrogen and a set amount of oxygen on this planet. Okay? If there's an area that's short of water, it's because it's, the cycle's messed up. Okay, we, we haven't lost any, we haven't gained or lost any. It's in the wrong part of the cycle, that's all. We need to get that back. So when we're talking about agriculture, um, only in a grazing system is nutrient recycling effective. Okay, uh, in a grain operation, you're exporting 80 to 90% of the nutrients off your land. Okay, it's gone, you're shipping it out. In a haying operation, you're exporting probably 70 to 80% of your nutrients off your land. You might put in some legumes and be bragging about all the nitrogen that that legume's bringing in. And you might get some of it, but you're exporting most of it. And you're also exporting all the other elements off your land and shipping them somewhere else. Okay. The advantage of livestock is they're 80% inefficient. Okay. They're a terribly inefficient critter, which is perfect for us because we're recycling that. So if you think about it, if 97.5% of those plants come from the air, we only need to get 2.5% from the soil. Now of that 2.5%, we're recycling 80% of that. It's going back into the soil. So it ends up it's only 0.5% that we actually have to get from the soil every time. So a very efficient system because livestock are inefficient. Okay. So uh, tell that to a grain guy that he should kick 80% out the back end of the combine. <laughs> I've done that at a few conferences. It's quite entertaining. So the reason the livestock work so much better at regenerating land, because they're 80% inefficient. Okay, what do we need? We need their poop. Pretty basic. Um, we need to put it in the proper spot. 
Okay, we don't want it in a feedlot. We don't want it all around the watering site. We don't want it in the bush. We need to put it out there, that high stock density member we talked about, get it out on the land and move it around. Okay, so this is a cow patty. Um, it's not decomposing though. Okay, what we need it to do is actually physically decompose. Okay, we need that manure to recycle as well. Just because it's out the back end of the cow doesn't mean we have it yet. We have to recycle it. So that leads to our next principle, uh, building biology. And a, a lot of it starts with the biology from the herbivore. Okay. Uh, they're my employees. They work for me. They work for room and board. I need to give them food, water, and shelter. And they'll work tirelessly for me. So earthworms, dung beetles, uh, bacteria, yeast, fungi, um, all sorts of critters that work on my, my ranch. Um, we need to keep them uh, healthy and happy. Give them, give them a place to live and give them food and water. Okay, real quick, I'm not going to go into detail on this, but the, there's lots of different bacteria out there. We talked about the nitrogen fixing bacteria with legumes. Um, it's actually not the legume that produces nitrogen for you. It's the bacteria associated with the legume that produces, uh, gets the nitrogen from the air and then trades it with the plant in exchange for sugar. So that's number two, actually, a, a mutualist. They uh, just do a, a black market trading underground. Um, they get the nitrogen, give it to the plant in exchange for a molecule of sugar, a fair trade all around. Okay, there's decomposers, there's pathogens. They're not always bad because sometimes pathogens are, are dealing with a pest of, uh, of some other kind. And there's also lithotrophs, um, pollutant degradation, nitrogen cycling, things like that. I'm not going to get into details on those, but there's bacteria in the soil that are very beneficial to us. We've got to make sure we take care of them. Uh, fungus. Um, one of my favorite fungus is the mycorrhizae fungi. I know there's a lot more fungus in the soil than that. Um, I have tons of mushrooms all over my place uh, on the ranch. There's puff balls and all sorts of different types of mushrooms. Mycorrhizae fungi does not have a mushroom stage. That's the sexual reproduction stage of a fungus. Uh, mycorrhizae fungi does not. So just because you see mushrooms doesn't mean you have mycorrhizae fungi. Uh, but it's a good indication that the soil is, you know, uh, good for uh, fungus. So what is it? It's a extension of the roots is how I look at it. So the plant on the left is a, you know, just an illustration of a, a root system. On the right is that same root system with a network of mycorrhizae fungi, uh, a healthy, healthy system there. So it can extend the reach of the plant roots about a thousand fold, right? Could you imagine how much more nutrients you can get uh, if it, your roots can run, a, you know, a thousand fold? Amazing what it can do. And remember, we only need to get 2.5%, but actually because we recycle nutrients, we only have to get 0.5%. So they don't have to do very much but that network can reach a long ways to get uh, nutrients. It actually connects plants together. Uh, it's an in information system too that they can put information back and forth. Um, can transport uh, nutrients to the plant, obviously. Uh, it's really good at finding phosphorus. We talk about phosphorus being bound up in the soil. Well, mycorrhizae fungi can get it for you. Um, they actually have a, uh, we'll call it root hairs, but it's actually the hyphae of the mycorrhizae fungi. They reach out and the tips of these uh, root hairs will secrete an acid that can decompose stone, right? It can break down rock uh, and bring nutrients to the plant. So this is an incredible employee for your operation. We need to take care of this, this fungus for sure. Earthworms, really important. Um, they are great at recycling material, plant material and manure. Uh, microbes love earthworm slime. So you want to increase the bacterial in your, in your soil, um, we need earthworms out there because they, they uh, really help uh, get more bacteria. Uh, they create paths for roots, water, and air into your soil. Okay? That water infiltration, that air infiltration into the soil is really important. Um, so earthworms are great at that. Uh, they also buffer the soil. Anything that comes, comes in the front end of an earthworm comes out the back end pH neutral. So we're, we're always constantly in agriculture worried about uh, liming the soil because of the, it's getting too acidic. Well, a lot of our practices are causing that acidity um, because we're killing off earthworms. Um, whatever goes in the front end, uh, if you've got basic soil, it comes out pH neutral. If you've got acid soil, it comes out the back of an earthworm uh, basic. So we need to take care of those guys too. Dung beetles, um, easy to take pictures of. 
Um, easy to see them, they're breaking down the manure, but there's something like 400 different species that make the home in a cow patty. Um, dung beetles are just easy to take pictures of. So uh, what do they do? I left you guys one joke. I think you could all get that. Um, it's really important to keep a healthy system to make sure that all these critters in the, in the dung pats are healthy so that they're decomposing. If you've got old gray cow patties like that one I showed you earlier, out in your field, you don't have a healthy system. They need to be decomposed. On my place, within about three days to a week, the cow patties are gone, okay? We need them physically to decompose and not just sit there and weather, okay? Um, so we need, need a healthy biology. Uh, we also need to go up above the ground a little bit too and get some biology going. Uh, predators, huge, huge importance in agriculture. Um, we wipe out tree lines, we take out riparian areas, and we wonder why we get a bunch of pests that show up. Okay, just a couple of examples is the dragonfly and the spider. Uh, very important, they're apex predators in the insect world and they can control a lot of pests. Uh, real quick example, the dragonfly. Um, every species is a little bit different, but on average they live about two weeks long. So we need quite a few, you know, generations of dragonflies throughout a summer to control flies and mosquitoes and other pests that we have. Um, and they're excellent flyers and they have great eyesight. They can pick things out of the air like uh, really easy. So the problem is, is the aquatic nymph stage of a dragonfly. So when it's a teenager, it's a water bug. It lives in the water. Uh, some species of dragonflies, that aquatic nymph stage takes up to four years to get a two week adult. Okay, so we really need to take care of our riparian areas if you wanna have dragonflies around to help you out. Um, uh, by protecting it, fencing it off, um, you know, not having chemicals going into it and fertilizer runoff going into it. Um, we need to take care of those uh, uh, water nymphs. All right. How about a fungal disease as a predator? Okay, here's another fungus that I, uh, uh, I've, I've actually seen this happen on my operation. Um, grasshoppers are a dry land environment. If you get moisture, this fungal disease comes in and wipes them out. And I've seen this in some bale grazing sites. Years ago, we had a drought and uh, um, I had some bale grazing sites that grew up, held the moisture. We talked about that soil armor. Well, that's a, a way to cheat and get soil armor on there really quick. Um, had a drought year and the grasshoppers moved in and it was a brand new pasture I just took over and they cleaned off everything except the bale grazing circles. Because in that bale grazing circle, it held moisture. And the grasshoppers didn't want to go in there because they, it was moist and they would go in there and they'd get a fungal disease. So they were cleaning off everything else except these circles. So that dawned on me. I know how to fence out grasshoppers. Uh, all I have to do is have more water holding capacity than my neighbor and the grasshoppers will stay on their land, not on mine. So that's what I've done over the years now. I don't get grasshoppers anymore. Uh, I haven't seen hardly any grasshoppers for many, many years. So they just stay on my neighbor's land. Uh, number five, a polyculture. To me, this is a, another really important one that I didn't really think about much when I was starting. Um, creating a polyculture in your land. Uh, nature will always fight against a monoculture. Okay? Uh, I've said this many times before, a monoculture is ugly. Um, nature doesn't want it. She will send in a weed to, to fight and get rid of a monoculture. She'll send in a pest to fight and get, in, get rid of a monoculture, a disease, right? All of these things are in modern agriculture, right? Then we need a pesticide and we need a fungicide and we need a um, herbicide. All of these things is to try and get control of one species, like one plant. Um, that's not what nature wants. We need a polyculture. So that polyculture of plants gets you a polyculture of roots, which gets you a polyculture of soil organisms, which gets you free fertility, okay? Why not? It makes so much sense. So uh, mother nature has no weeds. Um, I'm not going to go into my weed talk right now, but if you want, uh, there's a great article by a young lady. Uh, her name is Dana Kenyon on the Canadian Cattlemen website. You can search her name on there. It'll come up. It's called Just Another Weed Hugger. So she did an excellent job of uh, um, describing why, uh, why the monoculture is ugly. So um, that's the four or the uh, 10 points that I wanted to touch on today. Um, the Grazing concepts, if you remember them, was graze period, rest period, uh, animal impact, stock density, and soil armor. Okay, that's the, that's the how, that's what we're doing. 
and the why, the grazing uh, principles, we want to improve our water cycle. We want to capture as much sunlight as possible. Um, we want to recycle nutrients. We want to build biology and we want to uh, um, create a polyculture. Um, don't worry so much about the weeds. If you put in a polyculture, there are no weeds because you've filled in all the holes. So um, those are our concepts and principles that we want to talk about today. Uh, just kind of a real quick intro. Uh, this is my uh, shameless blurb, uh, shameless plug here for the, uh, my book. If anybody wants to order it, it's through the Stockman Grass Farmer bookshelf. Um, they published it, so uh, I let them do all the, the hard work. So if anybody's uh, got some questions now, I think we've got ample time for questions. Well, yeah, Rachel. You want us to roll through the the questions we gathered when people registered? Yep, I think we'll start going through people's questions. And if anyone has any other questions, first, thank you, Steve, for that great presentation. You bet. Yeah, let's let the questions come in. Do we have any? I've been watching the queue, but have, do we have any that we need to catch up on? No, the there has. No, I think everyone was keeping them for the end. Is there a chat where people are asking or do you just want to go through the list that you have there, Derek? It's primarily the list that I have, but I don't see much on the chat right now. So. Okay, so uh, what's the first one on your list? Let's see. Uh, first question I had was, what does your ideal pasture system look like? Layout, landscape, livestock? Okay, yes, uh, that's an easy one. Um, I actually just wrote an article about this. Uh, it's called uh, um, Creating an Edge. My ideal pasture, if I could build my own pasture, it would probably have about 10% riparian area, probably have 20 to 30% trees mixed throughout it. Uh, I'd like to have, you know, uh, some kind of water sources on that land and to have as much edge as possible because all the excitement happens on the edge. Um, if you picture a quarter section of land, or a piece of land, we've got um, four, ed four edges, right? The, around the out perimeter of that square would be an, at one edge. If, if you're on a quarter section, that's a half mile by a half mile by a half mile by a half mile. So we've got two miles of edge. If I put a shelter belt around the outside of that piece of land, I just doubled my edge because I have an edge between my land and the trees and I have an edge between the trees and the neighbor's land. Okay, so I'm, I'm up to four miles of edge already put a uh, water source in the middle, right? There's an edge between ecosystems. Um, between the water and the riparian area, there's an edge. Between the riparian area and the upland, there's an edge. And that's where all the interactions happen. I mean, some of the critters go there to eat and some of them go there to be eaten. It's kind of a, a bug eat bug world out there, but that's where our biodiversity kicks in. The more edge you have on a piece of land, the more more biology you're going to get. And the, the good part of that is you've also got an edge underground, right? So for all the edge you have above ground that you can see, the creeks, the, the, the difference in crops, right? If you've got um, uh, part of your land is native pasture and part of it is tame pasture, well, there's an ed another edge we've created between the two. You've got a patch of rose bushes in one corner. Well, we just created another edge in there. Okay, so I want to create as much edge as I possibly can. Have a creek running through it. Don't have it cut straight through as a trench because we only get a short amount of edge out of that. If it winds and curls back and forth, you can almost double your amount of edge you get. Um, so if I could build a you know, ideal pasture, it would be to create as much edge as I possibly can. Okay, we had a question in the chat that said part of our pasture has become mature is it better to mow it off or set our goats out to try and have them eat the late stage growth sorry what was the very beginning of that it the pasture is ma too mature oh too mature and does it have a bunch of weeds in it or or just maturity and it's new seeding so then it might be weedy okay so if it's if it's too mature obviously our, our graze period and our rest period aren't 
aren't uh, managed quite properly yet. Uh, again, comes down to those five grazing concepts. If we can manage that, we're not going to get to that maturity stage. So if you're there right now, um, in the long run, great soil armor. Good job. <laughs> but we need to leave it and then come back next year with a good graze period and a good rest period um, and, and get it, uh, uh, not allow it to get to that, that stage as much. Now, if it, you know, part of my pasture, yes, every pasture every year, part of it goes to seed. Right? I'm not going to say I never let anything go to seed. That goes, um, it is positive for the soil armor. It's also uh, put seeds out for the seed bank. So there's nothing wrong with doing that once in a while. But ideally, if you want to you know, have an economical uh, pasture, we, we've got to try and keep it in stage two. So we're at that point already. Mowing it, uh, I wouldn't because, uh, well, one, I don't have a tractor and a mower. But two, it's going to cost me to do that. Um, I'd rather leave that soil armor there for next year and, uh, and just graze it. Now turn the goats out by all means, get them out there and, and rotationally graze the goats as well. And, uh, yeah, that would be my suggestion. Derek, you got another one from the list? Yep. Uh, what are some considerations when converting cropland to pasture? Converting cropland to pasture. Um, this is uh, the, the, the couple of pictures I showed right at the beginning when we did the can canola stubble, okay, where we broadcast out on top and trampled it in. It's really that simple. Now, it doesn't always work as good as it's, it showed in those pictures. I'll tell you that right now. On cropland, it usually works quite, quite well. Um, not as good on pasture land, right? If we've got an old tired pasture and I throw some seed out on there and try and trample it in, if we don't get the moisture, it doesn't work very good. Okay, but when you get the moisture, and it's pretty well with anything in ranching, isn't it? If you're in farming, mm -hmm. <laughs> if you have a drought, nothing works. But if you have lots yeah. of moisture, it does. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't do much with it. I broadcast seed out and I trample it in and then I use my grazing concepts. Okay, that's the key to it. Um, on a year where we don't get the moisture, well, you know, it might not, everything might not germinate. But the seeds are still there. They might germinate next year. Okay. And as long as we can get the animals out there with that good graze period, good rest period, good stock density, right, to, to knock all those plants down, um, then we'll, it'll kick in and, and come in next year. So, yeah, it's as simple as that. I don't put much effort into my, you know, reseeding. It's just a broadcast. I've done zero till a few times. And the few times that I've done it, we usually get a drought and it fails miserably. And I put all that money and cost into renting some equipment. And, uh, yeah, it's... If it fails when I broadcast, it didn't cost me much. But when you get the moisture, it catches and you do do well. So, so I have a question. So if you're broadcasting out an old crop field, what if there isn't stubble or residue? What are you feeding the animals while they're out getting the hoof impact? Uh, wait till the volunteer comes up. Okay, right. Early in the spring, there's nothing there. But I wait until there's some growth, something for them to graze. Um, ideally time it when there's a little bit of rain coming, not a whole bunch of rain cause they're going to punch that out, but just a little bit of rain, uh, get the animals out there, graze it down. Then the rain comes, those hoof action, stimulate that a little bit, a little bit of moisture, get them out of there, right? If it looks like they're, they're starting to damage it, they got to get out of there. Um, uh, but boy, that little bit of rain coming right after, then it just jumps. Yeah, yeah, we have another... Usually volunteer coming. Question, how did you come to specialize in custom grazing versus running stockers or cow-calf? <laughs> That's a, more of a risk thing than anything else. Uh, I used to own my own herd. Uh, it was a small herd at the time. And I actually took the Ranching for Profit school back in 2001. Uh, highly recommend that school to anybody. And I learned how to do a gross margin analysis there. And I came home and did my numbers and I owned some cows. And I did some custom grazing because I didn't have enough cows to, to, you know, graze all my land. So I brought in somebody else's before that. And I did the numbers and I started comparing those two profit centers. And I was losing money like crazy on my cow herd. But my production practices, I was doing a really good job at them. But I was losing money. And then I was making really good money on my custom grazing. And I'm like, well, that's, that's not what I thought it was doing. So when I got rid of the cows... I could bring in more custom animals and make more money. So it just started because of the economics behind it. 
And then at the time I'd sold my herd, um, we had BSE hit, the drought hit, and all of a sudden a whole bunch of land came available because a whole bunch of farmers quit. So I started in 203, 204, 205, I started picking up land really cheap. Uh, the opportunity was there. So I, I, I grew really fast considering, you know, it's hard to find land in, in this area. Once 2007 hit, like I talked about the ethanol industry opening up, um, all of a sudden the grain industry got a big boost and then everybody wanted land. Then it was a lot harder to get land. So then I kind of, I started to shrink after that. Um, just the way the markets worked, but uh, it was an opportunity at the time and, and that's when I grew quite fast. Good. Um, I guess this one goes back to the last one, but we, you talked about putting out a pasture mix. What do your pasture mixes consist of? Uh, pasture uh, mix. Maybe not necessarily species, but what are you looking for as far as the percentages of grasses, legumes, forbs? Okay. So as a polyculture is what I'm looking for mostly. When I'm, for example, that uh, canola field that we took over, I wanted a polyculture of different types of root systems is my goal. Okay, so different types of root systems. Uh, wheat and barley is the same type of root system. Okay, they're, they're, they're very similar. So I want different types of root systems. So I would like some uh, legumes. I would like some creeping legumes. I want some taprooted legumes. Um, I, would, I would like some bunch grasses. So different types of bunch grasses to get you know, some root penetration and, and, and get down in that soil. I want some creeping grasses to be able to fill in all the holes. Uh, I'd like some shrubs. I'd like some annuals versus perennials. I'd like some warm season versus cool season. Okay, so all of these are different types of root systems. So what's gonna work in your area? Okay, species don't matter much to me. Um, we need to figure out what's growing in the tree lines and in, in the, you know, on the, on the uh, where you're not managing. What's natural in your environment? And then I put out as many as I can some of them might not stick, but I want that polyculture out there. So of those 21 species you saw in those pictures, uh, maybe only 18 of them actually germinated, but there was a mixture of all those different types of root systems in there. Maybe out of those 21, I only had 12 different types of root systems because some of the plants were, were similar, right? Um, you know, if there was a meadow brome and a smooth brome in there, maybe they had similar root systems or um, we, we've got to try and get as many different root systems as possible. So species and percentage, uh, I put as much as I can. So the percentage of everything is very low, but I'm trying to get a mixture of everything. Um, I usually put on three to five to eight pounds an acre, right? My little quad mounted spreader is not very accurate, by the way. Um, there's a, usually, you can see where we were. If you miss the gap, well, there's a big opening there. We actually did that on purpose on that one. We l left a big gap in the middle where we didn't seed anything. And boy, it's a big difference. Um, basically what we would do if we broadcast and trampled versus what nature would do by herself if we just trampled it. Um, big difference. It's still highly productive, but boy, no, very few legumes. It's a very drastic change between the two. I have a question. How do you cash flow renting rough land that needs lots of investment before it can support cattle? Ah, so I've, I've heard phrases before that never do anything that doesn't return its value in the first year. Well, if I'd listened to that, I'd still be driving a truck. <laughs> okay, so uh, it takes some money to get things going. So that first year, of course, I'm going to try and negotiate the land rent low, as low as I possibly can but chances are I'm going to break even on that first year because I'm going to take care of it. Uh, I want to leave lots of residue. So automatically when I first started, no, I didn't leave enough residue, right? So I was maybe getting more cash flow out of it than I was putting out. Um, now the land that's up and running, uh, it's producing and making me a, a good profit. I'm going to use some of that money and put into that new land that I'm just taking over. Now what I need to do though, is make sure I have a long-term deal on that land. Right. Hopefully at least five years, maybe 10 years or more, um, because I want to put money into that and uh, make it much more profitable, much quicker. Some of the land I took over years ago took me maybe 10, 12 years to get it to where I 
am happy with it because I wasn't leaving enough soil armor. Now I can probably do it in three or, or two or three or four years because I know how to build that soil now a lot better. Another question, how do you get water to your remote pastures? We have to build riparian areas. So the easiest way I've found to build riparian areas is, is build up dams. Um, if you hire someone to come in and dig a dugout, so that's a Canadian term, I think maybe a pond, I think you call it a pond in the States. Um, if you hire someone to come dig one, uh, it's pretty expensive, it's costly. But I can actually uh, bring in a smaller backhoe and just, if you position it in the right spot and create a dam, then you just back water up. You can get a lot more volume of water uh, by damming something up. So who's my best friend? The beaver. I love the beaver. Um, we got neighbors that try and uh, they complain all the time about beavers backing up water. Uh, I love the beaver. I want to import more beavers because uh, the county keeps blowing the dams and I keep trying to build them. So um, I've got a backhoe that I can go out and, and uh, create beaver dams and start them. I actually did that two years ago. I went out, there was an old beaver dam. You could see where it was. And, but it had broke loose years ago and there's no beavers there anymore. So I went out with my backhoe and started digging a hole and, and patching up that beaver dam. And within one year, uh, I've got a family of beavers there now. And now they're building it bigger. So I did the start of it and now they're taking over and uh, making it bigger. So getting even more water backed up. If you do it in the right spot, right? We've got very steep banks in that area on this, on this little runoff. Um, it's not covering a lot of land because it's, it's very steep banks. So if you pick the perfect spot for it, you can hold a lot of water with not a lot of work. Do you rely on that in the wintertime too then? Sorry, what was that? Do you rely on that during the winter months too? Uh, no, not necessarily. If I can get a big enough water source, I, I can. I've used winter water systems on, on uh, remote locations. Uh, depends on the on the land the train um, is how I can make that work I've got one one piece now that we've actually got a uh, I can run it as a continuous flow it's a very very large pond and we've got a um, a water line buried underground that comes out down downhill from it and I can just trickle that in the winter or the, or the fall or early winter into the trough and it just overflows and, and keeps going but then I have a, a winter water source with no pump no heat no anything uh, but of course, if you're going to do that for five or six or seven months, you need a pretty big water supply to be able to do that. Rachel, you got one? You're muted. <laughs> Hi, Kevin. Okay, I just I tried typing a chat question. But anyways, my question, Steve, is... Do you have any studies showing carbon sequestration per pound of beef raised per acre with regenerative grazing versus typical rangeland to feedlot finishing? We've actually just had that study done on our land. So over the last three years, they did a carbon sequestration study in our land. Um, to, to, not to spoil it on you or anything, but we don't have all the results back yet. <laughs> They're still compiling them. But they just did a three-year study. It was all across the prairies in, so Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba. They did 30 different locations, so 60 different pieces of land. So at every location, they compared a regeneratively managed pasture with a continuously managed pasture. And they tried to do the, um, all the analysis on it. So this was a three-year program, uh, very expensive. They put a lot of money into this one. Um, so hopefully we'll get all those results back soon. We, we do have some tentative results, but that was those uh, two core samples I showed you. Um, our regeneratively managed land was the, the very dark one on the left. And then the, the light one on the right was from the continuous grazed. So yes, I do have it. We did do the study. We don't have all the results back yet, but there are lots of other studies. I can, I can send links out later um, to a lot of studies of, of, on carbon sequestration. But uh, yeah, I don't have them off the, the, the links off my yeah. off the top of my head. We'd appreciate that because, you know, probably the biggest thing we hear from industry is how, how much more efficient, you know, this industrial agriculture is, you know, over feed efficiency versus, you know, 50 years ago, which, 
there's just so many factors in there that that can be manipulated so yeah thank you no problem <clears throat> The problem is with 50 years ago, the farmer was still making a profit. You saw the graph at the beginning. Who's making all the profit now? Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. <clears throat> Describe what things you, you are looking for to indicate your management is improving the land. What are some signs you've seen that indicate you are going in the right direction or in the wrong direction? Okay, how to, how to know if you're going in the right direction. Um, obviously, your production's going up. The, the issue we have is, is water is your most important nutrient. Okay, I, I'll say that right, right from the start. If you have a dry year, yeah, your production might be lower. If you have a wet year, your production's going to go up. So just by measuring production, you don't know if your management is doing anything or not, right? Weather has a lot more power over that on most farms than, than uh, we care to, care to believe. So how, how we measure that is, you know, for me, our production's going up, even though it's a dry year, we're still getting some good production. Uh, I think water, like I said, is the most important one. If we can hold on to that water, we're going to do a lot better than the neighbor's piece of land. Okay, by holding on to that water. So for me, obviously I'm, I'm keeping track. We've got a grazing chart that we measure yield. So we measure things in animal days per acre. And if I had two years that were the identical rainfall, I could compare that, yes, this animal days per acre went up on this one and this one, it, maybe it, it didn't. So maybe we messed up on this one and, and did a good job on this one. But because rain falls up and down all the time, we've got to use some, some uh, common sense there as well. Uh, generally, are my pastures getting nice and thick? Are they strong? Are they healthy? Um, are we increasing in desirable plants or are we increasing in undesirable plants? Um, to me, as long as we're managing those concepts and those principles, our economics is working, then, you know, production isn't necessarily my measuring tool. Okay, I'd rather be profitable over have high production. Okay, that's a big issue. Our industry is, is focused on the, the word yield. Everybody wants to know what your yield is. I would much rather want to know what your gross margin is. Okay, because I've had some really high producing crops that I lost money on because I didn't, you know, I didn't understand the gross margin at the time. Um, some of my land is lower producing, but it actually makes me more profit because I don't have as many costs into it. So I want to make sure that we understand... Uh, uh, the economics behind it, not just the production of the land. I think Derek, you talked about that. We might be uh, looking at doing a uh, a whole thing on economics if it if it works and people want to. So yep. that's a whole yeah. other. There's definitely an interest in it. There's yep. been a lot of questions about it. So, um, all right. Um, so you talked earlier about stocking density, but what is your stocking rate? How many acres per animal do you figure you need um, in your environment to get a cow through an entire year without hay? That varies quite a bit um, because we have such a, a, a variance of land. Okay, so half my land is bush, right? It doesn't produce very much. So our stocking rate on that is a lot lower. Um, we've got some native land that's, that's you know, improved, but it's you know, maybe somewhere in the middle. And there's some tame land or, or land that was broken up years ago, uh, seeded down, and now we're creating. It, it wasn't so good when I took it over, but now it's, it's coming back faster. And now it's really highly productive. So the quality of the land makes a big difference. But again, we still have to know the economics behind that. Um, so the stocking rate that we use, I've got a rule of thumb in my area. It might not necessarily work in anybody else's area, but for a grazing season, so I know part of the question was for year round, but for the grazing season, um, my rule of thumb is that I want one yearling, so a 700 pound yearling per open acre. Okay, so just to uh, quickly understand that, uh, on an average piece of land I take over, let's say it's uh, uh, 500 acres and 100 acres of it is bush. So we've got 400 acres of open land. My rule of thumb right away will say I can take 400, 700 pound yearlings. So 
when I calculate animal days per acre, that's about half of what a cow-calf pair is. So 400 yearlings or 200 cows or cow-calf pairs. Um, now, is it a pretty good producing land? I might go up a little bit. If it's a really poor producing piece of land, maybe I just took it over and it's been overgrazed for years, maybe I'll go down a little bit on that. But that rule of thumb in my area is one yearling per open acre. I just kind of write off the bush as extra um, and just count on open acres. So, and then when you want to get into winter grazing, well, do we stockpile that grass? Um, I don't necessarily do a lot of stockpiling because I'm a custom grazer. Um, common sense just tells me what I, I'm going to get an X amount of forage grown in a season. Okay, I've got four and a half months to grow grass. Would I be better off to sell all that grass in four and a half months and have four and a half months of labor? Or should I extend that out to eight months and sell that four and a half months of grass over eight months of labor? Okay, so yes, I want to, if it was my cows, I would graze as late as possible. Um, try and get eight or nine or, or 10 months worth of grazing out of that grass. But because I'm a custom grazer, that's just extra work for me. Whereas I can then bring in cows for the winter and bale graze and swath graze. And it's a whole nother set of labor with a whole bunch of uh, different sets of economics on. So as a custom grazer, I'm not really trying to graze dormant, or, you know, dormant grass late, late in the season. I have done. Um, I do it quite often because things happen, things change and, you know, cows leave early and I get a bunch of grass left over. So maybe I'll graze them early in the spring in the dormant season, or we'll bring in another herd and across and we'll graze really late. Um, but uh, yeah, it's a different scenario under a custom grazing situation. So I don't, I, I usually don't try and graze that late in the, in the fall. Now we'll normally, we'll go till November, October, November sometime with most herds. If uh, we have a drought year, it might back off to September, October. But when our killing frost hits in September 15th, I can pretty well tell, you know, how much grass we have ahead of us. I can calculate it out pretty close. Okay. Uh, we had a question. So grazing principles are universal across farm size, but what about the business aspects? Of, so a lot of the farms in Wisconsin are only about 100 to 200 acres. Yep. So some of these business principles, how would they translate to a small, smaller scale? Yeah, well, gross margin analysis is universal as well, but every farm is different. Okay, so that's what made me decide to go one way or another is because that economics changes. Every farm has an advantage and every farm has a disadvantage. Okay, maybe your farm, your farm, your land, your land is cheap but your disadvantage is that you, you've got so far to truck to your market. Whereas another farm, the land could be really expensive, but their market is really close. Okay, so every farm has a different advantage and a different disadvantage. So the, the gross margin analysis is what we need to understand to figure out which profit centers work in which areas or which farms. Um, I can't tell you, you know, you know, you've got 100 acres or 30 acres um, I'm not going to tell you that, you know, custom grazing is going to pay for you. Um, the labor component might be too high. Uh, for me to, to manage 50 cows, uh, it pays or divides out a lot better for me to manage 300 cows. Okay. Um, so on a small scale, you're going to have to change and adapt. Uh, maybe you can manage goats instead of cows or sheep instead of cows. Maybe you can implement uh, a layering of profit centers to make it work. Um, so it's hard for me just to tell you, yeah, on your, in your area on that size of scale, this is what you should do because I don't know your market advantages or your disadvantages or your, you know, your environment is different, but I can, you know, help people understand how to figure that out. Right. The, the, one of the biggest breakthroughs I ever had in my ranch was learning how to do a gross margin analysis, uh, understanding you know, they didn't teach that to me in, in college or university. They didn't, you know, my dad never taught it to me. I learned how to do it uh, in private education schools, ranching for profit, holistic management. Um, some of these courses that I took understands how to break those apart. And that's going to tell you what works on your farm or not. I don't know if I answered that question. I think I went off, off topic a little bit. <laughs> Who do you partner with for your custom grazing? Because I've had people in my area that are interested in custom grazing, but it's hard to find that match 
or someone looking to contract that out? Again, that's a different environment. Okay, there's, there's different market values to every profit center. Um, the, the rate that I get might be different than the rate that you would get because we're in different areas. Um, the demand might be different for any profit center. So uh, I remember I had a fellow phone me from the, United, from the United States one time. He was criticizing one of my articles because he, he th think, thought I was, wasn't telling the truth. Uh, there's no way that I could support a family on grazing. I think at the time I was grazing 2,000 uh, 2, acres. Um, he just argued that there's no way because he's a custom grazer and he can't possibly support a family until they got to 3,500 acres or 4,000 acres or something. And uh, didn't take us very long to figure it out. Well, my grazing revenue was at the time, I think it was 75 cents per yearling. And his grazing revenue was something like 40 cents per yearling. Okay, that's a huge difference in, you know, markets in different environments. So as soon as he heard that, then he understood why I could support a family on that uh, because he couldn't in his environment. But, you know, he had different advantages that I didn't. So we've got to look at those numbers. It comes down to economics. I can't emphasize that enough um, that uh, we need to understand. You can't, you can't farm like I do. You can't go out and, and try and do a custom grazing operation because it necessarily, it won't necessarily work in your environment. But the opportunity is there to look at it maybe you, you've crunched the numbers and find out that you're going to lose money custom grazing. Okay. So let's look at my example. If I'm custom grazing and it's making me a profit, but my cows were losing me money. Okay. The big reason why they were losing money is I was paying too much for grazing and it was my grazing. Okay. Because the opportunity cost, I could bring in someone else's cattle and custom graze for them at that certain market rate. I had to charge my own cows that price and that ended up, that was the highest cost for my cow herd was my own grazing because I have the opportunity of custom grazing. Now, if for some reason, you know, in another environment or even in my environment, if that market price changes, let's say uh, right now I'm getting a dollar 50 per cow calf pair. Okay. That's my daily rate for my, my pairs I'm grazing a dollar 50 per pair. Um, at that point, my custom grazing is making money, but if I own my own cows, oh, that's steep. I can't afford that. My cows will be losing money, <laughs> right? That's my market value. That's my advantage. Let's say that that price went down. Let's say that I couldn't bring in cows for, you know, maybe I can get them for 80 cents. Well, all of a sudden, 80 cents gross revenue. Now my margin changes big time. I'm still paying the same amount for land rent. I'm still paying the same amount for labor and equipment costs all of a sudden the margin's gone in my custom grazing, okay? But at that point, all of a sudden, as a cow owner, well, I don't have to pay as much for grazing anymore. I don't have to pay $1.50. I can, I can uh, graze cattle for 80 cents. So at that point, I might quit custom grazing and buy cows because I can graze for 80 cents, okay? So the market values change so much in different environments. So we have to, and it can change from year to year or from, you know, over five or 10 years, it can completely change. So we've got to keep up with that, uh, calculating those economics to make sure we're, we're still making, you know, a good margin on whatever profit center we're, we're, we've chosen. Um, let's see, next question pertains kind of to animals. Um, one of them is in regards to what your mineral program is. And then somebody is curious what you do when you need to administer shots, medication for pink eye and other issues like that. Okay. Mineral program and, and treatments. Okay. Let's do the mineral first. Now as a custom grazer, I'm pretty well limited to what my customer wants, right? It's their animals. They get to choose. So when I do a grazing rate, it's so much per head per day, plus the cost of minerals or salt, right? Some, some guys want salt, some guys want mineral, some want special mineral. Um, so that's, a, you know, whatever they want is, is added on top. I might go pick up the mineral or salt, but then I bill it through to them because everybody wants something different. So I will definitely advise them to go with mineral because, you know, I think that the animals do a lot better on, on mineral. I have less treatment problems when I have animals on mineral. And it almost has to be ahead of time too. Right? They, they should have fed mineral all winter. And then I have less problems in the summer. 
Now, in my environment, I know that our soil is low in selenium and in sulfur, right? When I've done soil tests, I, that's, those are the two things that they we're most lacking in our environment. Now, everybody else's environment might be different, but that's in our environment. So if the customer only wants salt, then I recommend that we use a salt that is fortified in selenium or fortified with sulfur, because I know that's lacking in our area. And a lot of times I'll still, you know, out of my own pocket, sneak in some mineral because again, getting into that pink eye problem and foot rots, I think that our immune systems are a lot stronger if they're supplied with mineral. Um, so I'll, uh, you know, sometimes I add mineral in as well. I, I, I really don't like it when customers just want salt, um, especially if they're reproductive animals. I mean, you know, my report card at the end of the year is if they're pregnant. Um, and if they're yearlings or uh, bred heifers, well, report card at the end of the year is did they gain well? Um, and how much, uh, how much treatment did I have to do as, as the custom grazer? Um, for example, we have uh, a good example this year. I've got six different herds. Uh, one herd I've got a pink eye problem in. They came in looking pretty poor. You could tell they didn't have a mineral uh, mix all winter. Uh, they were, you know, primed to gain good weight, and they have, but we're having a pink eye breakout uh, in that herd. Um, the other herds, all five other herds, I haven't treated a single animal for pink eye. I did treat, in one herd, I treated two cows for foot rot, but they're in a very low land, right? It's been flooding all year, so that was expected. And, uh, but zero pink eye in any of the other herds, none, none at all. And um, all the other herds are either cows or bred heifers. So most producers in the wintertime, they, they take good care of their cows or their bred, bred heifers, right? Because they're breeding animals. So they give them a full mineral package. Um, the feeder heifers that I brought in, well, I'm sure they didn't have mineral all winter. So um, that's why, in my opinion, that's probably why I'm getting issues with, uh, with pink eye. So how do we treat that? Uh, I'm not much of a cowboy. Um, in college, I learned the only useless rodeo sport. Uh, I was a bull rider. Doesn't do me a lot of good now on the ranch. Um, I don't even have any bulls on the farm. So the, uh, I'm not much of a roper. So we have a couple of things we use. We've got a portable tub system. So it's a portable tub alley and squeeze that we can move around to different sites if I need to. Uh, I can set it up within, you know, three or four hours and, and uh, bring an animal in and treat it. Or we do have a stock doctor as well. You can sneak out and, and uh, most of my herds get really quiet. Um, they're, they're quiet enough as a herd that you could walk through them because they get so used to moving. They, they like me. So you can easily walk through them and hit them with a stock doctor. Um, I don't know, you guys know what that is? A, uh, a long pole with the, the needle or medicine on the end of it. Anyway, you look up stock doctor and it, uh, it works pretty well um, for treating. Now, like I said, though, I don't usually have to treat very many animals on our place. Um, with the system that we have set up, they, you know, on an average year, I'll treat out of, let's say, you know, 12 or 1300 head. I'll probably treat four or five animals for the summer. Uh, this year, this pink eye breakout has been a lot more, uh, but it's one, one herd and one, they came in with pink eye. And then of course, I, like I said, they, they didn't have a mineral package. So, and there's, of course, the owner only wants them to have salt. So um, I believe that's what's going on there. But most years I don't, I don't have much for treatments. Did that answer that? That was a double question. Did I get it? Yeah. How do you feed your mineral? Is it, is it free choice or not free choice, but like cafeteria style? Is it pre-mixed? Just free, free choice, uh, uh, pre-mix. Yeah. Our, uh, our local feed mill knows that our land is, is uh, low in selenium. So basically all the mineral mixes that we get from them has a, a much higher uh, percentage of selenium in it than most. Uh, I, I remember years ago, they used to have a little waiver you had to sign as a producer buying it that you're acknowledging that it's a high percentage of selenium above the recommended rates or something. But, um, but yeah, they, it, it's a lot better for the animals because we're, we're definitely lacking that in our environment. Okay. Yes, with, the, with pink eye, mentioning pink eye, one of the questions was managing for flies. Do you have any tricks? <laughs> yeah, uh, we kind of talked about that already. Um, my dragonflies. 
Okay. My spiders. Um, we actually put up bat houses. I had uh, bats that were trying to live in one of our water houses a few years ago. So I, I uh, got some bat houses built and put them up. A lot of my landowners have, uh, they're retired, you know, old retired guys that looking for hobbies. So they uh, build bird houses. So we got bluebird uh, houses all over, like lots of different pieces of property. So I'm, I'm looking at the predator, okay? How you address flies, well, you, you need predators. And most of our agricultural practices are wiping out our predators. And then we complain because we have too many flies. Um, I did write an article, if you go to the Canadian Cattleman website, uh, it's called Shoe Fly Guy. And it talks about how we need flies in our environment. We just need them to not become a pest. And that's when the predators come in. You go out to one of my pastures, because I've been managing those riparian areas for years, um, you can count more dragonflies in the air than you can flies. Because they're just like, you can look up and probably count 50 dragonflies. Um, because we've protected those riparian areas. And, and honestly, I, I don't have a fly problem. There's one of the other, um, I was going to say with newly, again, newly converted low fertility pastures or um, other nutrient deficiencies, you don't fertilize, you just let. So if it took 30 years to damage the land, I'm probably not going to fix it in two or three, right? So if there is a, a major deficiency, we don't have the biology there to get it going. We, you know, I'm not completely and totally against bringing something in uh, as long as it's economical and it's going to, you know, help your situation. I don't do it, right? I mean, I bring in selenium and sulfur through the cattle. Okay, we're bringing that in. But like I said before, 97.5% of the plants come from the air. Okay, there's very little that it actually needs from the, from the soil. Now, we need to get that biology going. To get the biology going, we need to fix the water cycle. Okay, we need to hold on to moisture. So again, somehow get that soil armor going and, and build that biology. Right, put those two together and your land should start taking, taking over and taking off. Um, how are your lease agreements arranged and how do you navigate fencing and other infrastructure on leased land? Uh, lease agreements. I do have a, a, a lease agreement, a standard one, and I'm more than willing to send it out to anybody who wants it. I can probably send it to you guys and you can pass it amongst all your, whoever wants it. Uh, I would definitely get it, uh, take it to a lawyer though, because this is out of Alberta. <laughs> And we've got different laws and stuff here. So you'd have to get it definitely uh, figured out for your environment. But the basics are all there. Um, uh, fencing, I, mean, I, I want to get as long a term deal as I possibly can. Now, a lot of landowners are iffy, right? If they don't know me, it's a trust thing we need to build up. They might not want to do a long term deal because they don't know me. Am I going to wreck the land or am I going to not pay them? Or So it's a human resource thing, right? Communication and, and uh, talking with them and, and building trust with them and, and getting this, this implemented. Now fencing, a lot of the land is already perimeter fenced that I'm taking over. Uh, if it's grain land, yeah, probably it's not. They've ripped out the perimeter fence. So that all goes into my gross margin calculation. And I already know that how much I can pay for rent uh, ahead of time. Okay, before I even, you know, uh, gone and, and negotiated with them. We've talked about it. Obviously, we, I, I know the land's available, but I've already run through a, a, a pasture calculator and figured out, well, estimated from experience and other pieces of land, what I can produce on it, how, what my costs are going to be. And I already know what I, you know, top dollar I can pay for rent. If they want more than that, well, I'm going to say no. So um, fencing, yeah, if there's no fence on it, well, it's going to cost me more. So then I want my rent a little bit lower to offset that. Maybe I'll negotiate that in the first year, I'll pay this much. And may, after that, we'll pay a little bit more because I've got to put fencing in there. But those decisions or those, those conversations are really easy when you know the gross margin on it, right? When you understand the economics behind it, it's really easy to make those decisions. Um, that's one of the biggest advantages of understanding the gross margin analysis is uh, makes decisions easy. 
right? It's either a yes or no, because either I'm going to make money or I'm going to lose money. Then we had a question cool. about strategies and approaches for grazing in a colder climate. Ah, grazing <laughs> in winter. Um, so totally different talk than what we did here today. Uh, winter grazing for me, uh, you know, dormant season works. You know, if you can get a dormant season grass going, that's great. Uh, I do have some, from time to time, I have some year round herds that I keep, you know, uh, 365 days a year. So then I want to graze as late as I can, right? Try and get six or seven months out of that. Um, keep my customers happy. Um, but when that runs out, then we've got swath grazing options. We've got crop residues. So I might swath graze a crop residue or we might bunch graze. That's a whole nother topic. Um, and bale grazing is a great way to bring in, uh, you know, free carbon into my land. So I'll bale graze as much as I can. If I've got somebody else uh, who owns the cows, who's willing to pay me to feed them, uh, they buy the hay and I get all the free fertility and, and water holding capacity. I'm all, all for that. So uh, I definitely like doing some winter feeding, some winter grazing. Um, but uh, every year is different for me because I've got different customers all the time. Um, there is a question about stockpiling. Uh, I don't know if you do a lot of stockpiling or not, but the question was, should you clip it before you let it stockpile or just let it go as is and then types of forages that stockpile best? Okay. So stockpiling, like I said, I don't do a lot of stockpiling because of a custom grazer, but when I do, um, there's kind of two ways that I've stockpiled grass or how I graze late in the season. Uh, one is it's just part of the rotation. Um, and really hard to do in a long, you know, in a short grazing season that, that I have or growing season that I have is, you know, four and a half months of growing season to try and get 12 months of grazing, right? That's pretty, pretty hard. Uh, the latest I've ever grazed is into uh, end of February on stockpiled grass. Okay. So I, I've never made it all the way through a year on st stockpiled gr grass in my environment. Now, if you've got six months growing season, uh, maybe you've got a better chance of doing it. Uh, but my four and a half, really hard to do, really hard to do. So when I graze through the whole winter, then we've switched on to some swath grazing, which is a, you know, uh, hopefully a polyculture, but it's not always. Sometimes it's a monoculture. Um, some grain farmers around me, if they have a wrecked crop, they'll phone me, right? There's, you know, it didn't produce very good. It's not worth combining. Um, I love it when there's a whole bunch of weeds in it, by the way, uh, because then I get more of a polyculture. Um, uh, and then we'll, we'll swath graze throughout the whole winter and finish it off. Uh, now, I definitely don't want to be out there in April because that's when our spring breakup comes. And, you know, having a large herd out on a, on a piece of grain land in April, that's pretty devastating to the land. So we want to be done by April and back on some, some solid sod. When that spring breakup comes, it's uh, pretty hard on the, on the land. So uh, one way to do um, stockpiled grass as well is to use a disposable herd. Okay, so a disposable herd is a second herd that you have come in. A lot of people will use custom grazing to do this. So they'll have a cow herd and they have a custom grazing herd. So they, they bring, you know, let's say you have one chunk of land, half of it you graze your cows on and half of it you, you graze the custom animals on. Once your season gets partway through and, you know, you're getting close to the end, get rid of your custom cows early, get them out of there. So real sim simplistic uh, looking at it. Let's say we graze both herds, one rotation on all the land, and then you get rid of your custom herd. Now your cow herd gets to finish, do the second rotation on their land, and then they get to do the second rotation on the custom grazing land. Okay, so you just extended your grazing season uh, by only you know, by not having too many animals. A lot of people have too many animals. Um, if you can bring in a disposable herd that you can get rid of, then you can make yourself graze a lot later, right? Some people will do it with a hay field. Instead of that disposable herd, you'll just hay half of your land the first time. And then the second time around, instead of haying it, you graze it. So you can use the same idea. But again, I'm not a big fan of haying because you're exporting nutrients. You're not getting the biological animal impact out on that land either. 
So I'd much prefer to use a dis disposable herd. I'm going to save any of the people that are on the phone want to unmute themselves and ask any questions, they can feel free. Otherwise, we'll just keep rolling through our list. Yep. So would you re recommend using stalker cattle as a disposable herd or st stalkers too high of risk? Depends on your environment. Um, I, I'm, I'm a pretty, I guess I'm, I'm pretty chicken. I don't like a lot of risk. Um, that's why I'm a custom grazer. It's pretty dependable. Um, I have bought my own animals a few years and if you do it on the right year, it works. If you do it on the wrong year, you lose, lose your shirt. Um, so that's a, a risk I'm usually too chicken to take. Uh, I'm not a big fan of, of owning animals. I've seen too many wrecks. Uh, I know that's a, a lot of people don't like it when I say that, but uh, custom grazing is more reliable. Uh, it's less risk. I have something called an Animal Keepers Act. Um, I don't think you guys have it in the U.S., but we have it in Canada. Basically, it, it's an, uh, a provincially legislated act that allows the animal keeper, which would be me, if I don't get paid for my services, I can sell their animals at auction and get paid. Okay, I have a lien on their animals as an animal keeper. So man, that's the best protection I have. If, if, you know, if I own my own cows and something happens to the markets and, you know, I don't, I don't get paid. Well, I don't get paid as a custom grazer. I'm guaranteed to get paid because I have their animals. Uh, it is a, a lien of possession only. If I let them take their animals home, then I lose my lien. So they have to pay their bills before the animals leave. Um, so as a risk factor, boy, uh, Animal Keepers Act is the, my best friend. So that's another reason why I don't own cows is my, my risk is a lot lower. But not saying that that doesn't work. I have a friend who has been doing stalkers for a few years and he's probably up $100,000, he said, uh, because his stalkers have been paying very well. I don't think he's hit the bad year yet. He's just had a couple of good years. So, um, But uh, um, I'm not saying it, it you know, it, you do your numbers and you evaluate your own risk and you, you make your own decisions but it's a lot easier to make those decisions when you understand the economics behind it. It's funny because the person you're talking to is an economics guy. <laughs> so. I know. It, it's, <laughs> I know I, uh, I'm the grazing guy, but boy, economics is number one on my list. Uh, it, 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 it just can change your entire business around if you understand that. Cause most farmers don't like, I emphasize it a lot. Uh, because most farmers aren't taught that, right? They just do what they do. And this is what dad's always done. And um, I know really important. Uh, understand the grazing part too, but it doesn't matter how good of a grazer I am. If I, you know, if, if my margin is, is bad, right? Like if I pay too much for rent or I'm my, my costs are getting away from me, it doesn't matter how good of a grazer I am if I'm losing money at it. So I've got to understand the economics on every profit center um, or else I'm wasting my time. There was another question um, in advance of, I think, multiple enterprises on your operation. You said you also do pigs some, but not really. Are you guys yeah. kind of multifaceted in your revenue streams or mostly just... Uh, the what we were trying to do is... Uh, develop some other profit centers, right? I saw custom grazing starting to, to drop a little bit. And remember I talked about maybe if the, if the market values ever change, I might need to, to do something else, right? I might need to change. So we experiment with different profit centers, right? And our pasture pigs is at that point right now, we've been experimenting for a few years. We're pretty small, but we're learning how to do it so that if we, if we ever need to, maybe we can, you know, jump in uh, a, a lot bigger. Um, so we like to experiment on, on a small scale and, and try other profit centers. Uh, as of right now, custom grazing is still my, my number one profit center, but there's, uh, there's no harm in uh, experimenting and, and playing around with some other ones too, just in case in the future. So yeah, our pasture pigs are, uh, I'd say they're still in the hobby stage for sure, but they're, they're sure fun. I enjoy them. They are a lot of work, but I enjoy them. There's nothing happier than a pasture piggy. You go out there and they root and, root and toot and come running over to you and they're the happiest critter on the planet. So, 
So do you have any tools that you use to assess economic viability, certain spreadsheets, websites that you would uh, need? Yes, I do. Um, we've got quite a few different, uh, basically Excel, Excel spreadsheet calculators, um, you know, a whole gross margin analysis program. Um, I've got a pasture calculator that I, that I run. You can do it on any, um, it's just structured for pasture, but I also do one for our pasture pigs. Um, yeah, definitely. It's, uh, very Is that important one you made up or one available through a website or? Uh, I can send some of them to you guys and you can disperse them right. as you feel. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. All right. Like you mentioned earlier, I think what we should try to do is maybe do another one of these where we look at specifically those spreadsheets that Steve has or created or shares with us. I think they benefit a lot of people. So are you really quiet, Derek, I'll, for some reason, all of a sudden? No, so. I don't know what's going on. Or I don't even know where my mic is on my computer. But I just <laughs> said that you and I had talked a little bit about maybe doing another one of these with a, a gross margin analysis type one where we can look at some of the spreadsheets available and um, yeah. <clears throat> some of the stuff that you offer. So. If we wanted to do another one of these and, and go through just economics, okay, I could definitely go through some calculators, the pasture calculator. Um, I've got a grazing chart. It's actually a computerized version that uh, uh, not only calculates the animal days per acre and converts it to dollars per acre, but also uh, can do a rough gross margin for you on each individual pasture. Um, uh, pretty, pretty easy. Uh, it's not a, it's just an Excel spreadsheet. So it's not all, you know, not a real fancy one, but it's uh, pretty straightforward and, and does the job for sure. Uh, we could definitely go through that and I could, you know, if we did a session like that, I could supply the grazing chart out to you guys as well. So. Yeah. I think there would definitely be some interest in that. So. Yep. yep. Um, and I guess that kind of segues maybe to the next question, but advice for anyone starting up a grazing operation and what considerations should they take into effect during a pandemic? Oh, a pandemic. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, just plan for the next one, I guess. Right. <laughs> like I said, my, uh, my risk management. Okay. So in all the herds of cattle that I've managed or I've all the farms that I've consulted with, and you know, we've done gross margin analysis on their, on their herds. Um, there are some producers that are making a profit. I'm not saying there aren't, but a good majority of them are not making a profit on a cow herd. Okay. Whether you're in, you know, Canada or the U.S., a lot of the places I've dealt with, it's pretty hard to make a profit. One of the reasons is there's too many hobby farmers. Okay, there's too many people that love cows and they will raise cows no matter what. They will subsidize their cows. They will have off-farm jobs to have cows, to keep their cows alive. Um, what happens when you oversupply a market with animals that are under cost? right? Well, the price goes down. So everybody loses money. If every farmer right now who was losing money on their cows quit, boy, I bet 75% of them would be gone. Okay. Um, and I'm talking hobby farmers that have a thousand cows. Okay. They have a big, you know, some other industry that they're working at that's supporting those cows. So um, the problem is that the, the producers that are making a profit on it, they're making a little bit. Uh, all it takes is one catastrophe and they just lost years and years of profit right if they're making a little bit of profit every year and like for us in Canada when BSE hit I, I hear farmers still saying that they've just barely recovered from BSE okay they lost so much money in that that now they're starting to finally get out of that um, an epidemic like uh, COVID-19 hits well all of a sudden the markets like shut down people got stuck with herds that they couldn't sell what they were planning on selling right so there goes the last three years of profit you just made on your cows. You lost it in one year. So there's a lot of risk in owning cows. Okay. There's other profit centers that are less risky. Uh, I'm not just saying custom grazing, but uh, you know, sheep or goats or, you know, rabbits or whatever you, you come up with something and, and look at the gross margin analysis on it. See if it's a good, you know, an acceptable margin and then uh, weigh out the risks. What could happen? What can happen? Uh, that's where the human resources comes in. Um, what are you willing to risk and what are you, you know, what can you afford to risk? So it comes down to uh, 
you know, what's your risk aversion as well? What was the other part of that question? Uh, it was just some, what, what should they consider during a pandemic? Oh yeah. Uh, during a pandemic, I don't know. I think it's just more considering, you know, expecting something to hit, whether it's a, a virus or a, a border closure or, you know, um, a drought in another country or a surplus in another country. Um, we've got a plan for those bad years. So when I, when I do a gross margin, we, we calculate our numbers on the worst year possible, right? What's the worst year you could possibly have? Do your numbers. Are you making a profit? Okay. And then when the, when the good year hits, you're way above what you estimated. So that's, that's how I plan my, you know, plan for the worst year. When I'm plan, planning my uh, numbers for my custom grazing, it's on the drought year. Can I make a profit in a drought year? If I can, then I'll go ahead with it. If I can't, well, I can't count on good years every year. So then we might have to switch into profit centers that are more controlled maybe more or less risk to make sure we go through that. So, and I can't tell you what those are because I don't know what your area is, but maybe you have different markets available for different uh, types of animals, different, different classes of livestock. Okay. Uh, what are your thoughts or insight on silvo pasture and the general use of wooded or tree dominated areas? Okay, uh, so forest and pasture. I would say about half of my land is bush. So we, we are in, actually, our soil zone is classified as gray wooded, uh, gray wooded soil zone. So it was basically produced under leaf litter. If it's open land here, it's been bulldozed. Um, a lot of this land was bulldozed 50 or 60 or 70 years ago. But if it's open land right now where I am, it's, it's uh, because it's, the trees have been knocked down. Um, so I still have about 50% of that. It's all bush and we do graze it, but we manage it a little bit differently. Uh, my first rotation, a lot of times I skip a lot of the heavy bush paddocks, try and get around all my open land first uh, once. And then on the second rotation, we might, we'll include the bushland in it. Uh, depends. Some of them I can't really skip, just depends on which pasture and how it is, but it's definitely a part of the, part of the grazing, but it's, it's kind of the extra. Um, on a drought year, I might graze the bush twice. On a regular year, maybe I only hit it once. Um, try and, trying to manage for the woodlot too. I mean, that's an important part of biodiversity as well as keeping that intact. I don't want to convert that necessarily to a grazing species, right? I don't want to knock it down and get rid of all the saplings so that we end up with grasses growing in it. Yeah, maybe I'd get more grazing out of it, but we're going to sacrifice a lot of the, maybe the biodiversity, the, you know, habitats for birds and wildlife and things like that. So, so I do, I do graze a lot of the bush around, but uh, I graze it a little bit differently. We have one last Facebook question was how far in advance do you have herds lined up to custom graze? How far in advance do I have for custom grazing? Um, I've got, I've usually got a set, you know, some of my customers are repeat. And then some of them come in and go. So sometimes customers leave because they want to, and sometimes customers leave because I want them to, right? If the checks are slow to come or they're not doing what they said, well, they don't get grass next year. And, you know, some years I'll have a customer for four or five years and all of a sudden they find pasture closer to them. So they, they don't need it anymore. So uh, we'll, we'll roll through customers. Um, you know, I'll have one for four or five years and then we'll switch to another one and I'll have them for four or five years or, um, so basically my existing customers get first choice, right? If you had cattle with me last year, well, and then, you know, in February or March, I'm talking to you going, okay, do you still want pasture? How much do you want? And if, uh, they want less, or maybe I've got more land, I can bring in more a new customer than I do, but my existing customers get first choice. And then from there, I'll fill up with, with new customers. So as of right now, this year, I've got uh, five different customers. And so it'll vary. Some years I have five, some years I have eight, some years I have two, right? It just depends on the, the situation. Some years I have a year round customer where we have their cattle for the summer and for the winter. Um, obviously they get priority on summer grass too. 
and then other years we've just got animals coming in for for the summer so just depends on who the customer is and what they need to, that given year all right uh what trainings uh do you have other trainings you'd recommend uh, i know you know there's ranching for profit there's the soil health academies there's savory courses trainings resources or some anything else that if somebody's interested in this more of a regenerative agriculture approach where they can learn some more yeah um anything yeah definitely ranch for profit or holistic management they, those were the two big ones that got me going but uh there's lots of different private education out there uh, seminars conferences too just you know getting out there uh, reading uh, now we've got you know social media where we've got little videos and stuff um, we've got to basically keep our mind open and keep learning right i still <laughs> i'm learning every every day um, one of our my wife and i our goals is to keep learning and to keep moving and keep uh, improving um, so I, I love listening to to different people go to go to conferences and listen to different speakers but um ranching for profit and and uh anything from the stockman grass farmer so jim garish um everybody's got a little different angle to the same thing in regenerative agriculture right there's there's lots of us out there i, I call us pasture preachers we're all out there preaching the same story but a little bit different um there might be terminology differences and you know ideals that are a little bit different but we're all generally looking at the same same direction so um, a little different from what academia teaches for sure uh, again academia is teaching modern agriculture what is being done uh, not necessarily what should be done so we need to look at some of the private industry education and and get this regenerative agriculture going because that's what's really lacking in our industry um, modern agriculture is not working we need to fix it all right, well, I guess we can say thank you for all you contributed to the discussion. People can reach out to you directly through the Greener Pastures Facebook page. Do you have a website as well? Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I, I'm quite active on the Facebook page. I hardly ever look at the website. It'll, I think it'll uh, send you to the Facebook page or my email address. Um, if you want to get a hold of me directly, definitely email is the best way to get in touch with me. Uh, I'm very hard to get a hold of on the phone. <laughs> it's uh, your voicemail, right? That that thing annoys me. <laughs> but emails, I can check when I can. Um, definitely, uh, I don't mind answering emails. So I, I get, you know, probably between Facebook and Twitter and phone calls and emails and three different accounts, probably 50 messages a day. So um, I like to uh, be able to put them all in in under emails and answer them when I can in the evening. So. So you got a good grazing Definitely. joke to leave us with? Pardon, what was that? I said, do you have a good grazing joke to leave us with? A good grazing joke. Uh, um, I've got my bull joke. I can tell you the bull joke. Um, sure. yeah, there was this farmer who owned three bulls. There was a big bull, a medium bull, and a little bull. And uh, they heard rumor that the farmer was going to go buy a new bull. And they didn't like that. They were like, well, that's, that's no good. We don't need a new bull. So the big bull says, oh, I'm not giving up any of my cows. I've got 40, 40 cows of mine. Those are mine. Those are, I'm not giving any bull, any cows up. No way. And the medium bull looks at the other two and says, well, yeah, I'm not giving up any cows. Those are my girls. I got 20 cows and I'm not giving them up. And the little bull goes, well, yeah, me too. I got 10 cows. I'm not giving any up. So the farmer pulls into the field with the stock trailer backs up and he opens the back door and this enormous bull steps out just massive steps out and snorts and grunts and these three bulls look at him and the big one looks at the other two and says well i could probably spare a few cows you know i could give up a few girls and the medium bull goes yeah i could give up quite a few yeah he can have some of them i'm not messing with him and the the, the big bull and the medium bull look over at the little bull and he's pawing at the ground and snorting and and challenging this big bull and these two other bulls look at him going what are you doing do you see the size of him and the little bull looks over at him and goes yeah i know i just want to make sure he knows i'm a bull <laughs> so yeah that's my favorite favorite joke 
a little less fun with half most 90 percent of the people muted <laughs> but, right yeah <laughs> <laughs> um, if that, people want to stick around, we've kind of got breakout groups assigned by our grazing networks throughout the state. Um, otherwise, you know, Iowa, I think, got lumped together, Illinois. Um, so I'm excited to maybe chat with some of my neighbors for a little while after this. So thank you again to Steve. A thank you to Grassworks. And also a big thank you to Wisconsin Farmers Union for all they do. And they were a big sponsor on this event as well. So at this time, I think we'll have Heather switch us into the breakout groups. But thank you, Steve. You bet. Happy grazing. Sorry, Thanks for you joining bet. us. <laughs> okay, so what's with the breakout groups? I don't think you're in one. I'm unless in you, one? you got lumped into <laughs> one. <so. laughs> All right. If you want to join ours, you could. But <laughs> okay. All right. Well, thank um, you very much for having me. Yeah, we'll see you again soon. Hopefully all right, God bless. Okay. Yeah. Steve, you were all by yourself with your wife. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> I can join her and we can have a chat? Right, right. <laughs> but thanks, Steve. We'll, we'll catch you another time, okay? You bet. Thanks. <laughs> thanks. Take care. <laughs> all right. I don't know what's going on now. I don't know. I don't know how this goes. People who are unassigned. It would be Kevin. I don't know how this goes. I want to know if I can join. Let's see. Join. 